I want to welcome people back for part three of Larry Ross, uh, teacher extraordinaire and master storyteller. We keep dipping in. There's seemingly no end to the stories that Larry has to tell. And now we're actually going to sort of begin at the beginning for Larry. Um, another way that I interacted with him over the years is through something that was called Crate Day. Um, and towards the end of this session, we'll talk more about the history of the Lindbergh Crate, but we're going to jump right in with a program that he had put on every year. Uh, let's see here in his backyard. Yeah. You're seeing, uh, so this this is Larry Ross's backyard. And yeah. Where, where was that located, Larry? That was on Easy Street. I and, love that, on Easy Street. Larry Ross yeah. lived on Easy Street. Yeah, that was perfect. That, in, in, in Canaan, the land of milk and honey. There you I, go. I, I had a great address. Um, living on Easy Street was a wonderful thing for me. And um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to share these stories with you dave i um, uh, whenever whenever when you how did you put it um no end to the stories mm -hmm. one of the one of the the wonderful things of having a great wife like rebecca um i'll, I'll get telling stories and i'll say well people seem so interested in my stories and as she reminded me one day she says um you confuse people's interest uh, you confuse people's politeness with interest. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so anyway, I, 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 I'm going to take this as all interest on your part, Dave. And this it is. is. My backyard. This is my little museum in the back, as David referred to it as, as the Lindbergh Crate Museum. But this is a day that, that I did. This is how I became a teacher. I, w I started doing this long before I was a teacher. Oh, I okay. I didn't realize that. Yeah, I got my museum up and running, and I started volunteering. I started bringing kids there from the um, Canaan Elementary School, and I just, when I was a when I was a young kid, I, I I loved history, and I loved going to places like my museum, and and I thought that I was going to be a history teacher, and just kind of through. The, the, the road not taken, you, you know, you end up going down another path and that led to other things. And that led to my career working with adults with developmental disabilities. But as a hobby, all during that time, I was opened up my museum and I was meeting with kids and I was just having so much fun meeting with kids. And I said, I, I got to the point where I, I was, become a bureaucrat really at the job that I had and I did that for a number of years and all of a sudden I realized I'm getting over this and before I get really over it I'm going to be done with it so I don't get burnt out on it and I stopped and I said I'm going to try to become a teacher and I kind of managed to work my way into a teaching job but um, so in the course of my teaching for my students I, I would end the year with this event where I would bring kids that I had, but also kids that I didn't have. I would invite other schools and other teachers, and I would probably bring every year, uh, you know, 150 kids out to the house and mm -hmm. some adults. And I would, in the background, you could see my barn there. And, and on the barn, I would have what I called, um, I called that the Lindbergh Crate Wall of Fame. Oh yeah, there we go. There's the Wall of Fame. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. And there's We've Lindbergh got, too. Yeah, there's Charles Lindbergh. Okay, mm -hmm. and um, Jerry Mitchell. Um, I, I, I'm trying to read the names. Jerry Mitchell was a report was a reporter that had received an award at the Colby College. The and Elijah the, Lovejoy Award. Elijah Lovejoy Award, exactly. Um, and Jerry Mitchell is, is just a fantastic example of the Gandhi be the change you want to see in the world. Jerry Mitchell had unearthed all of these unsolved civil rights cases from the 60s and, and Mur brought, murders, right? Murders. murders. Brought to justice the guy that, um, um, the, the bomber that had bombed the Birmingham church bombing with the five little girls were killed. Mm -hmm. And, um, oh, and also the, uh, a civil rights leader that had been killed at the time. Mm -hmm. And just Jerry was just an amazing person. And, and Pat Mackin, there's a name 
Pat Mackin on the right hand side. Um, yes, right there. Pat Mackin was somebody whose son, Michael, was killed in Afghanistan. Okay. Michael McGreevy was killed in Afghanistan. A lot of people might be familiar with the movie, The Lone Survivor. And The Lone Survivor is the story of a SEAL team in Afghanistan. Michael was killed going to rescue the SEAL team. And when I went to Arlington Cemetery one year, um, I received a phone call before, as we were getting ready for the trip. And this woman said, I understand you're a teacher that brings kids to the cemetery. And I said, yeah. And she said, well, can I bring, um, can I send some brownies to you when you go to the cemetery? And I said, yeah, I guess you can. Why do, why do you want to send me brownies when I go to the cemetery? And she said, well, my son Michael is buried there. And whenever I go to see him, I bring him a brownie. And I sent him brownies wherever he was in the world. And I would love for your children to go to Arlington and have a brownie and think of my son. And I said, well, you, you know what? Why don't you come and bring the brownies with you? And she did. And she came and she she came with her daughter-in-law and her little her granddaughter Molly, and she told picture, told stories about her son, who was the honor man of his Navy SEAL class. The honor man is picked by the class members as the person that best reflects who they all believe themselves to be. Michael McGreevy, whose personal creed was walk humbly, do justice, love greatly. So he we go to the cemetery, we have brownies with Pat Mackin. And if you could go back to the other slide, Dave, just for a second. Pat Mackin is in this crowd with little Molly and her granddaughter, and they're in their backyard, and they're awaiting the arrival of a Marine Corps helicopter. There's gonna fly in and land in my backyard, and it's all people that I don't know. I, I would do this event and I was the smallest US Air Force approved, US Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, and Army air show in the country. I had to go through an approval process at the Pentagon and do all these things. But I got started at this 20 years ago with, a, with an Army National Guard guy who I called and said, will you come down here and land a helicopter at this event? And it was so great. The guy could have brushed me off and said, no, we don't do that. But he came down and looked what I wanted to do and why I wanted to do it. And that got me started. So here are these kids that are going to watch this Marine Corps helicopter land. And we had this all arranged. So this Marine, these Marines get out of the helicopter and come up to Mrs. McGreevy and present her Mrs. and Pat Mack and Michael's mom. They're out, they all get out of the helicopter carrying trays of brownies. And we all sat there in my backyard and had brownies. But this, when I started doing Crate Day, the, the idea for me was to consider Charles Lindbergh, he connects into this in his can-do spirit. Mm -hmm. And over the years, that can-do spirit gets reflected by all kinds of different people. And, and, and really, at the end of the 20 years that I did this, it was much less about Lindbergh and much more about all the people that I had met along the way mm -hmm. and all the people that made that happen. I, the very first year that I did this, I knew I wanted to have an air show. Yeah. And I, I didn't fly. I didn't. Oh, and this. Yeah. There it is. There's the Army National Guard helicopter flying over. There's the Marine Corps helicopter flying over. The guy that flew this helicopter the next year I met the kids in Arlington. The guy that flew this helicopter heard Nancy Chamberlain tell a story how she wanted to always go to the site in Kuwait. Nancy Chamberlain is the mother of Jay Aubin. That's right. And she we told the story. About in the first episode. That's right. She told the story about how she wanted to go to the site where Jay had been killed. Mm -hmm. The guy that flew this helicopter into my backyard went to that site, took a photograph of himself standing on the spot and sent it to me to make sure that Nancy had that, the way all these people connect. Mm -hmm. The guy flying the helicopter in the background, on the very last day, the first year that I didn't do the big event in my backyard, 
I gave a talk down at the Canaan Elementary School to the kids down there about kids that had been to Crate Day the year before and they would have come one more year. And they weren't coming that year. And when the Canaan Elementary School, every morning after they do the Pledge of Allegiance, the kids all yell in unison, don't quit, keep trying. Mm -hmm. So I go in and I give this talk to the kids and this little girl says, why did you quit? And I said, I didn't quit. I'm going to write another chapter. You, you go through parts of your life. Your life changes and your responsibilities to other people change. And uh, we're going to sell our home. We're going to downsize. And I'm going to figure out something else to do with the crate. But the fundamental story about it is still important. Mm -hmm. And I'm, that's why I'm in here talking to you about it. I didn't quit. So I went home from school that day. And I pulled into my house at 4.30. And I went in the house. And all of a sudden, I hear this whoomp, 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 whoomp. And I know it's a helicopter. I know the sound. And I go running out. And that black hawk with the same guy flying it that's flying in this picture, I run down into the field and back of my house. And this black hawk does a big sweep and pass over my head, does a circle, and comes back and does another pass. And I know it's Colonel Dave Smith from the Army National Guard. And I send him a text, keep your damn helicopters out of my yard. <laughs> and he writes back and he says, I got up this morning and I realized this was the first year that I wasn't going to be at Lindbergh Crate Day. And I had to fly down to Augusta. And I'm coming home and I look at my watch and I say, this is going to be just about right. Mm -hmm. And I fly over your house thinking, maybe I'll catch him. Mm -hmm. And he does. And every year I would say to people, this was the best Crate Day ever. And I said to Dave, best crate day ever, Dave, you and me, that mm -hmm. for me to go home on that day and to realize something was as important to me, it was just as important to Dave. And trying to instill in kids, I always said to kids, the point of the aircraft to me was I would envision people. They would fly over and inevitably there would be somebody in one of those aircraft looking down, smiling to themselves, thinking about, being a kid and looking up and saying, wow. And here these guys were looking down and saying, wow, guys and women. The first year that an Army National Guard pilot showed up with a woman pilot, all the adults were like, wow. And all the kids were like, no, this is the world we live in now. Mm -hmm. And to watch those changes over the years. But, and the first guy that, flew for me was Chuck Chinquette from Chinbro Corporation. I didn't know Chuck, but I knew he had an airplane and I called him and I explained to him what I wanted to do. And Chuck showed up and brought a bunch of his friends. And Chuck was a part of this story with me the whole way mm -hmm. to be able to go down to Washington, DC. And I would give kids a bookmark that had Chuck's, had a picture of the Kittery Bridge on it and had how he made things work. Treat people with respect. Your word is your bond, be honest. Don't give up. Think as a team. Give back from what you take. That's who Chuck, that's who he was as a person. And to be able to say to kids, when you drive over the Kittery Bridge, if you look at that bookmark and you imagine that's how this bridge got built. And then to bring kids down to the Air Force Memorial and stand there with kids and say, this was built by a guy who started with his brothers in a couple of pickup trucks. And here's where their vision ended up. Here's where their dream ended up by doing simple things well. Mm -hmm. So that's what I, I, that's, that's what I tried to accomplish in the yard. Mm -hmm. This is a great picture, Dave. I don't have this picture. Mm -hmm. I can send it to you. I, I want you to, I, this guy flying this helicopter, this guy Fester, I had to build the helipad for this helicopter to get on. It's much bigger than the Blackhawk. Yeah. And the guy that was supposed to land this helicopter there, we had been putting this thing together for months. And the guy that was, that all the guy I have been talking with, okay, didn't show up on the last two days before he said, I can't make it. I'm going to an event at my school my kid's back to school day, but another guy is going to fly in and land there. And don't you worry about it. And I said, okay. They were going to come in and land on a Thursday afternoon to make sure everything was safe, have the helicopter in the ground, take off that morning and come back and land that afternoon, land the next day at Crate Day. 
while they flew in on Thursday. And if you can see, this helicopter is running parallel to the tree line. Well, when he came in to land, he was coming in perpendicular. I live on the side of a hill, and to him, you can't gauge the hill. And he's trying to land perpendicular. I'm trying to talk to him on a radio, but I can't, it's too loud. So I'm trying to pant him, I'm trying to give him signals about how to turn him around and get him to land parallel. Mm -hmm. This thing, it, it's amazing when you're looking at this thing 50 feet from your face, yeah. and it's tons of steel hanging in the air, and it looks like a 1968 Rambler. I mean, it you know, looks rugged. Well, and, and all the debris it kicks up. Oh yeah, well I'm trying, I finally get him on the ground, and I can see the guy in the cockpit, and he gets out of the cockpit, and I can tell he's upset with me. You mm -hmm. can tell he's like, what am I doing? <laughs> Who is this? this guy is nuts. Larry Ross is nuts. That's how we started right. off. <laughs> That's right. Here's this guy pantomiming me down. What the hell am I doing here? And he gets out of the helicopter, and I say, let me show you why you're here. And I go walking up to the stone where Jay Aubin stone is, Mm -hmm. On the day that I dedicated Jay Aubinstone, I got the Marine Corps to land in my backyard that day as well. And the guy that landed that day got killed in Iraq the next year. And he's buried down at Arlington, and we go to visit his grave. And this guy, Fester, Scott Whitaker, walks up and he looks at that stone and he says to me, how do you know David Green? Mm -hmm. And I say, David Green came here just like you did. Mm -hmm. And he said, David Green was my best friend at the academy. Wow. And that guy, I could call him today and tell him anything I wanted to tell him, and he'd do it. Mm -hmm. and, and that, it's the, same, it's the same story over and over again, yeah. that people extending themselves. Mm -hmm. The day that this guy was standing here, we had our flyover. And the guy that was running the flyover was a guy that had flown over for years. And he was is, it, is it this guy right here? Yeah. It's San you got it, Dave. I mean, okay, there's all these flags in the background that we put out for one of the servicemen killed. There's Moral standing there. There's Moral on the left. Okay. There's Larry, there's always in the middle. Always in the middle. Um, here is... Sandy Whittier, Sandy Whittier was a C-5 pilot that had flown for years that Sandy got it. He understood what I was doing. He had never been here, never met me. When he retires, I say, you come up and help me with the air show because I've been doing this all myself. And we're standing at the Paris end of my little airplane, the Spirit of Canaan. Well, I, Sandy, actually have, I actually have a picture of it back here. Yeah. Yeah. This, this would fly from a plywood Statue of Liberty to a plywood Eiffel Tower. There's Jeff Clark, who would run my, he was the air boss. Yeah, he, made, he made the Wall of Fame. He's on the Wall of Fame. He was the air boss. He, every year he would show Superman. up. Superman. Yeah. He would take over that part of the job. Mm -hmm. He would take that part of the job, and the kids would fly in the plane back and forth. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the guy that made that story upon story upon story. <laughs> But, but Sandy Whittier, go back to that other picture of Sandy for just a second. Sandy, Sandy's there, and Sandy's, we had some guys flying A-10s out of Barnes Air Force Base, and Pat Mackin and her daughter-in-law, Laura McGreevy, Michael McGreevy's wife, the guys in the A-10s are flying around, and the guy comes on the radio, and Sandy comes over, and he says, the A-10 guys want to talk to Laura McGreevy. I said, okay. And, and we said, where is she? And somebody said, she's down at that Marine helicopter. They had donuts down there. And she was down there. Have, her daughter wanted to get out of the helicopter and have a donut. So Sandy goes walking back down to the helicopter. And we're all standing down there. And all of a sudden now the A-10s are flying along. And the guy in the A-10 comes on and says to Michael's wife, I know that you're there. And I know the the pain that your family has had. And if there was ever anything I could do to relieve that pain, I would do it. But there isn't. And this is the only thing I can do for, for you today. But this is for you. And he comes flying in over the, over the helicopter. He's at about 200 feet tops. And he's doing a, a barrel roll. 
Mm -hmm. And then he flies over inverted. So you can see him. He's upside down and you can see him in the cockpit giving her the thumbs up. Mm -hmm. And and like all of a sudden, like you turn around, you look, and here's all these rough, tough guys. All have done tours in Iraq and Afghanistan now. And they're all turning away. They're for clump. They're, they're crying. And Sandy turns to me and he says, um, he'd been in the he'd been in the air force for like 30 years mm -hmm. he says i've been to air shows all over the country he says um he says I, i've never been to anything like this he says this is just so wonderful mm -hmm. and the same thing you, you know like and and here's moral here's sandy um th those connections and those connections mm -hmm. all of these adults who started as kids and who grew into people that um, you're not going to read about any of them in the history books, maybe moral, but you're not going to read about these people. But these people are the fiber that, that, that as Margaret Chase Smith would say, honor is earned. Mm -hmm. And you look at those flags in the background. And you recognize that each of those is an opportunity. It's each of those is someone and what their story is and who they would have connected to. And what do the flags represent? Those flags, those were flags that when those flags represent what I would do there is I would keep tally of how many servicemen like Jay had been killed in the war. Okay. And every year I would lay those out. I initially got those flags to do a flag display like I've done down at Margaret Chase Smith, and we use those to commemorate those lost on 9-11, mm -hmm. is how I originally got them and how I originally started. Mm -hmm. But then when I started going to Arlington, I started making connections down there. And every year, whenever they take flags out of service down to Arlington because they were too beat up, mm -hmm. they, would, they would save them for me. And so pretty soon I had thousands of flags. So that there was a point in time there, I think the last year I did it, there were like, 6,000 lost wow. in Afghanistan, and I had that many flags out in the yard. Mm -hmm. And the kids would do that. We would, we would have it all prepped. That day, I'd have a dot on the ground mm -hmm. where every flag would go. And then that morning, the kids would descend, and they'd, boom, create this thing. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty neat. Mm -hmm. It was pretty neat. And well, again, we're working a little backwards here. So um, we're going to tell more about the history of the crate um, as a preface to talking about some recent news about what is going to be happening to the crate. And that connects sure. back to Moral Worcester that you see here. That's right. Um, so um, I think, oh, well, maybe you can tell the story of the crate. Yeah, have you, have you got, is there a st story in this sequence? Yeah, okay, this is a good place for me to start. This is, Charles, Lind Charles Lindbergh flies to Paris in 1927. First nonstop solo flight across the Atlantic. When he leaves, he's the flying fool. When he lands, he's Lucky Lindy. Mm -hmm. He says, I'm neither one of those things. I, I wasn't a fool and I wasn't lucky. Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Mm -hmm. I had a vision, I had a plan, I had a team, and I stayed focused. He accomplishes what he sets out to accomplish by practicing and putting into place ordinary things done extraordinarily well. So this is a photograph of the crate. They've taken the spirit of St. Louis and they've dismantled it. The fuselage of the plane is in this box, and the wings are in that other box that are on the deck. With the soul with the sailors standing on it and Lindbergh's right here, right here yeah right there the wings are in that box the fuselage is in the big box Lindbergh intends to keep flying around the world and calvin coolidge says nope you're a real commodity we're going to put you on the uss memphis flagship of the atlantic fleet mm -hmm. and bring you home to the united states admiral guy burridge who was the commandant of the Atlantic fleet, this was his flagship, was on the ship and asked Lindbergh if he can have the crate as a souvenir. Oh, okay. And Lindbergh says, sure. Admiral Burridge brings it to his home in Kentucky, New Hampshire. And what else have you, I, 
brings it to his home in Kentucky, New Hampshire, and turns it into a guest house in back of his house. So in, 19, um, in 1990, 1990, I'm reading the Morning Sentinel, and I see this little story about this thing that's down in the woods is an AP story about the fact that a land developer has bought this piece of property and on the piece of property is this building that had that was made from the crate that brought the spirit of St. Louis back to the United States. When I was a kid, my parents, my mother was from Colorado. My parents met in the service and we would drive out to Colorado every summer. And I would be in the back of the station wagon with a map and I could pick where I wanted to stop every day and go to some historical site. And we had gone to Abraham Lincoln's house and I'm at Lincoln's house in front of the front door one day and I'm making a pattern going back and forth in front of the steps. And my dad's yelling, get in the car, get in the car, get in the car. And I said, I'm almost done, I'm almost done. He says, what are you doing? I said, I'm making sure I stood where Abraham Lincoln stood. I knew that if he came out of the front door, I would have had him. And when I, so I said to my wife, I'm going down to New Hampshire to look at this thing. And I went down to look at it and I walked in there and I, said, I, I felt that sense of I'm where it's been. I had been to see this. We had gone to this, see the Smithsonian when I was a kid. I loved the movie, The Spirit of St. Louis with Jimmy Stewart. And my dad had been a pilot. So I was about planes and about history. And so I go down and I look at this thing and I say, this is awesome. And I come home and I say to my wife, um, I've decided I want to buy a snowmobile. And she says, you want to buy a snowmobile? I said, yeah, I want to buy a snow machine for $3,000. And she says, well, if I guess if that'll make you happy, buy it. I say, that'll be okay with you? And she says, yeah. And I said, I changed my mind. I want to buy this instead. <laughs> I, want to buy, I want to buy this crate. So I go down to the guy that owns it, and he had been offered $5,000 for it, for somebody that was going to cut it up into little plaques and sell it that way. And, and, that's, and, I, and I said, I want to buy this thing. And they said, I'll offer you $3,000 if I can use all of your equipment to move it out of the woods. Mm -hmm. And he says, help. He says, you know what I've been offered for it? And I said, yeah, 5,000. He says, and you're, and you're offering me free. And I said, yeah. And he says, help me with the math. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, I'm going to use it as a museum to tell kids the story of Lindbergh's flight, which is really about having a vision and a plan and a team and staying focused. That's really what it's about. Mm -hmm. And he says, I like it. Let's do it. So I went to Tim Ames at Ames Mobile Home Sales here in Canaan. And I said, it looks like a mobile home to me. Can you get me a frame mm -hmm. and a truck? And Tim said, yeah. And I said, what's that gonna cost me? And he said, we'll talk about it. And we, it was great. That became the theme. We, we never really talked about it. Yeah. Tim got on board and said he was gonna do it. And that became how I got this all done. It was having a vision and having a team. And I called it the schemers and dreamers. Mm -hmm. And people that kind of bought into this idea. And we went down and the guy let me use his equipment and we pulled it out of the woods. And that's what it looked like when it came out of the woods. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you have a photo in there of what it looked like when I had it at my yard. Um, I, yeah, you know, I never got, um, I, that's never all right. got I never got, I, I think they're in a, a different uh, envelope. That's okay. That's yeah. okay. What I did. What I did was I found photographs of what the Admiral had it looking like in his house. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm going to make it look exactly like that. So this is the, you're looking at the basic box, but when the Admiral had it, you, on, on this one, for instance, you can see a line on the far end, a diagonal line going up. He put, he put a, um, a roof on it and mm -hmm. he put two porches on it and he put all these other um, made it into this beautiful little building. And, and that's what I did. And I had it at my house. But then I realized that over time, uh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, there you can see some of the porches, like that big back porch. That's a big mezzanine that runs along the back of it. When I had this thing planted in my yard, I, 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 I really wanted to talk to people that had a connection to it. And there was a couple of great articles that went out in magazines that connected me to all kinds of people but one of the people that i found was a grandson of admiral burridge who came to the house and came to see it when i really had it i hadn't done anything with it except to get it planted in my yard and i had only seen one photograph of it that 
just showed it from looking from not this back side, but the opposite side. And when this grandson came to the house, he, he said, well, what are your plans for? And I told him what I was gonna do. And I showed him the photograph that I thought was the front door. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, that's really the back door. He said, here's what it really looked like. And then he showed me this picture with this giant porch running all the way around the building. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, um, he, he kind of looked at me and he said, um, and, and all of a sudden I realized, oh man, I didn't anticipate this. And mm -hmm. all I could think of was ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. I didn't have a lot of resources to put into it. And, 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 and I must have reflected that on the look of my face when I looked at the photograph. It was a total surprise to me. And all of a sudden, he looked at me and he said, um, you are going to do it as grandfather had it, aren't you? And I said, uh, yeah, I am. Mm -hmm. Well, about a week later, a letter showed up from him with all these photographs of his grandfather and all this stuff about his family and a check. Hmm. And he said, I knew that that was a surprise to you. And I know you want to have it like grandfather had it. So make sure you have it like grandfather had well, that's it. That's great. I did not know that. And his grandchildren, years later, showed up. Mm -hmm. And now I've got all this stuff about their family in the crate, about Admiral Burridge and all these things. Mm -hmm. But that was a part of it. So eventually, I mean, I, I had it looking just the way the grandfather had it. Uh, this flag that is flying on that pole, the first time that flag was flown, it was raised by a guy who was on the USS Memphis oh, wow. with Charles Lindbergh when he came back from Paris. It just goes on and on and on, all the little webs and connections. Yeah. But long story, when you go back to the first picture you showed there in this series mm -hmm. of the... Uh, here's the crate. Now, Rebecca and I have sold our home on Easy Street. And we've no longer living on Easy Street. No longer on Easy Street. We're down on Oaks Pond, and I've dismantled it, and I've brought it down to put it on a trailer again and got it back down to Tim's yard mm -hmm. with the plans that I'm going to donate it to the Maine Aviation Historical Society and put it up at their museum up in Bangor. Mm -hmm. But near near where Pilot's Grill used to right. be. That's right. That's right. So when we get up, but when we get up there, all of a sudden I was viewing it as a display. Mm -hmm. The code enforcement officer in Bangor was viewing it as a building. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden to put a building up near the airport, it got really complicated really fast. Then all of a sudden out of the blue, I get a call from Moral Worcester, mm -hmm. who from doing now Moral up in Columbia Falls has a beautiful little museum that's made up of things that people have mailed him from, here's my grandfather's diary, here's my grandfather's uniform, here's my husband's, all these contacts that he's made down to Arlington. Connected to Reese Across America. Connected to Reese Across America. But what is really nice for me when I go up there, I'm one of the displays. Huh? I'm, the, I'm the teach and remember, honor, teach, because moral <laughs> relates that, Okay, he says, I come to your backyard and I see what you got going. And I'm thinking to myself, I ought to take this up a notch. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make something happen different. And then the kids start showing up and Moral goes from one truckload of Reeves to now they will send Reeves to every national cemetery throughout the entire country. Mm -hmm. And they will talk to kids about the idea of remember, honor, teach. But it's, it's kind of fun. I'm connected to the teach. Mm -hmm. So, moral, so moral, moral is like me on steroids. Mm -hmm. And he wants to do something in Columbia Falls that the way he tells the story, when I'm a kid growing up in Columbia Falls, you could, you could make your whole future right here. Mm -hmm. He says things are different now. Mm -hmm. And as major an employer he is, it's all natural resource based. He runs, he does reeves and gravel and concrete and peat and woodlands and all kinds of natural resource based things. But Morrill has an idea that he wants to promote tourism and 
give people something to see. Mm -hmm. So he brings me up there and he tells me this plan that he has. Morrill owns a hundred square miles of woodland that he tips for the reeves. Mm -hmm. And he brings me up there and he says, well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to apply to the Veterans Administration and tell them I'll give them a piece of land where they can have a veteran cemetery because there's no veteran cemetery in um, Washington County. And mm -hmm. then he says, and you want to send the crate up here and we'll put the crate up next to this chapel that I built up here so that when people come here to see reeves across America and see where the reeves come from, oh yeah, and by the way, every tree now down in this 100 square miles, if you're a veteran and you want to put a dog tag on that tree, I'll make you up a dog tag and say, this is your son, your daughter, your mother, your husband, your wife, and we'll tip that tree to make reeves. And, and he says, and we'll park the Lindbergh crate down here because the thing can do is what made this country what it is. Mm -hmm. And to make this country what it is, I want to build the world's largest flagpole. I want to put the world's largest flagpole on a hill here in Washington County that'll be big enough so when the sun rises, the top of this flagpole will be the first thing that the sun hits. Mm -hmm. It's going to be top of the flagpole, I think, is going to be between 14 and 1600 feet above sea level. Wow. It's just this, it's an idea that if mm -hmm. anybody else told me the idea, I'd be like the parents down with Mrs. Saracini and say, yeah, yeah, sure. I'm going to get away from this guy. This guy's nuts. Mm -hmm. But he's a guy that when he said to me, I'm going to cover Arlington Cemetery with reeds, he did it. Mm -hmm. When he said, I'm going to build a veteran cemetery here, he did it. When I went to the cemetery with Moore one day and I had to, we show up there one year and we're supposed to be driving into the cemetery and following Morrill's truck into the cemetery. So we get to the cemetery and Morrill's truck's not there and Morrill's not there. And Morrill calls me and says, Larry, I'm stuck in traffic in Philadelphia. I'm not going to get there in time. You got to get into the cemetery and get to the truck and make sure the wreaths come off first for the tomb of the unknown and all this stuff. So you got to get in there and get that taken care of for me. And I said, Morrill, how am I going to get into the cemetery? I always followed you in and I always followed the truck in. They're not going to let me in. And he says, Larry, Larry, Larry. I was standing in your backyard and you got the Air Force to fly over your backyard. Now just go up there and get in the cemetery and just go get it done. And he was like talking to me like I would talk to a fifth grader. And I said, that's what I need to do. Mm -hmm. So now here we are full circle. I got the crate up tomorrow. I brought it up there the other day. I brought it up there with the help of one of the kids in your photograph. He now runs his own construction company. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think and that I kid helped me get a stone up there, and there I am up there with with Morrill, and and Morrill's telling me when we when we get it there, yeah, Henry Bono right there, Henry helped me move a big stone that I had in front of the crate, and I go up to Morrill, and I deliver the stone to him using Henry's truck, and I say Morrill, this is so cool, here's this kid that stood at Arlington with you making this happen get this stone up here for you now you you're the steward now you're going to get to tell the story but i'm going to bring jay stone up there here's haley holt i'm going to bring her portrait up there there's samantha turcott aaron lebron sebastian dumont these kids that i suspect they have little fragments of this kicking around in their head and now moral is going to get to He's going to get to use the crate to tell the can-do story. And I'm going to get to tell the story that, to me, at the end of this, Lindbergh was always a part of it, but he was less a part of it by the end. It mm -hmm. was more about Chuck and Sandy Whittier and just so many people that I could tell stories about. But, but the opportunity that we all have to, like, so I'm delivering the crate and Moore says, Larry, he says, I want you to know, you know what else they're doing today? He says, they're doing the test borings for the flagpole. Mm -hmm. He says, because he says that flagpole, he says, we still don't quite know what it's going to cost because we have to know how big the foundation is going to be. So we're mm -hmm. doing, it's going to be, the flagpole is going to be 80 feet in diameter at the, at the base. And the flag is going to be an acre and a half. Mm -hmm. 
and and so like I'm standing there, and I'm and I'm as I say to Henry, I say, "Is he going to do it? I don't know, but is he going to try to do it? You bet he is. He's going to try his best to get it done. And if he gets it done, great. If he doesn't get it done, well, that's good too, because mm -hmm. you're you're working your way through it and you're doing your best. Mm -hmm. So it's it's pretty neat for me, Dave. I mean, it's 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 coming full circle. Well, and, yeah, and. I think that's a good place to end because we've been able to bring a lot of threads full circle. Um, as I've told people along the way, you're full of stories and there are many more stories we could tell, but I like the fact that we've brought it full circle. And to, for me to bring it full circle, I started off with an image that said, uh, Larry Ross is nuts. Uh, you're not nuts. Uh, you're a genius and, and your genius is, <laughs> Well, your genius Why is a coyote. <laughs> that, well, yes, yeah. But the genius is that you bring out the best in people, and it's not just kids. You know, you got you got adults to do things that they never would have thought of doing, or uh, and then even when you put the thought in their mind, probably didn't believe it could be done. But your genius is that you make people do amazing things. Yeah, and I get the chance to do it with them and mm -hmm. um it, it's it's i did i i continue to live in the land of milk and honey on easy street it's good well, you you bring it wherever you go well yeah. thank you i, I thank you very much this has been fascinating for me uh, this for as long as i've known you there's new information i learned today and i hope people enjoy hearing your story and i hope they'll have a chance to get to Columbia Falls and learn more about the story. And we're we'll gonna make Columbia Falls a, a new tourist attraction in the state of Maine. Thanks yeah. in part to Larry Ross and Moral Worcester, who um, as a young boy got inspired by a trip to Washington, DC, as Larry Ross has inspired many young people in the Skowhegan School Area District 54 area by taking them on these amazing trips. And I'm just glad I was able to be a part of one. So thank you very much for sharing your stories. And I hope you have many more adventures along the way. I, I'm, I'm sure I will, Dave. And I, I, I love seeing the senator smiling in the background the whole time as a kid. It's just yeah. perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much, Larry. Thanks for the opportunity, Dave. You're welcome.